Hey, I'd like to welcome all of you. How many of you are uh, joining us for the first time tonight? Good. Thank you for coming. We uh, started this program, I'll tell you very quickly, in 1930. And it was a method of sharing some of the excitement, the discoveries that the scientists were working on here at the Harvard College Observatory with people who live locally. And it's grown and grown and grown. And I have to tell you, I won't tell you what, but next January, February, March, we have some unbelievable programs and people coming in. We are most fortunate to have them here. Uh, so consequently, please put your name down on our mailing list. We will send you our flyer, let you know what's coming, make sure you're part of it. We have observing events. Sometimes we call them at the last minute. We're going to talk about one of those in a little bit. When something happens in the sky, you'll know about it before anybody else. We'll go to all of our telescopes up here on the roof, and we'll look at the universe from there. So it's a nice idea to be on the list. We don't sell it. You don't get any uh, solicitations from us. But it's used for us to communicate back and forth with you. So if you haven't signed up, please do. And I promise you, 2014 will be the year of profound questions, hopefully answers to. So thank you for joining us. We'll begin in just a couple of minutes. I shot that the other night walking out to my car in the parking lot. All right, at 7.15, I would like to welcome you all here tonight. This is our warm-up program before our main feature in our presentation. And what I'd like to do now is just relay some of the things that we have been working with in the media group this month that jumped out at us, that caught our attention, that you may have seen or may have missed but many of them originated from here, the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. One of the first ones you may have seen, anybody familiar with this picture? It went global about a week ago. We discovered a very peculiar type of Earth-like planet that when it formed, apparently must have formed inside this star. And planets can't do that. So the other option was it migrated, something pushed it into its orbit where we find it today, but the truth is it wouldn't be in that orbit if something pushed it there to get it there. So we have discovered a mystery planet and now we've identified four more. We simply don't know how they formed. It doesn't relate to any formula, any idea that we have right now as to how planets form around stars. It's a mystery, and this one went global with one of the stories that came out of here. This story just appeared yesterday. This is M87. I know all of you know what that means. It's the 87th object that Charles Messier saw when he was looking for comets, the comet ferret. It is a galaxy, an elliptical. It's not a spiral like ours. It doesn't have pretty arms. But this has been a famous galaxy because we've been able to see something in it that we haven't seen too much out of other galaxies. And that is this monstrous jet coming out of the galaxy. The source is up there, and that up there is actually the center of the galaxy. It's a black hole. And this is a huge jet shooting out of this black hole. Now, we know all big galaxies have black holes, but this is one of the few that we've been able to image. If we could look at it in this artist's representation, see the jets shooting out of the spinning black hole that is located in the center of the galaxy? Well, we have a giant black hole in the middle of our own Milky Way galaxy. It's located near Sagittarius. This is a summertime constellation. And if you really use your imagination, you can connect the stars up here. There's a handle up here, a bottom, a teapot. And it would look, use your imagination, think about it. There it is. Good. That would be the teapot. It points right to the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And hidden behind all of these clouds and all of this dust is our black hole. 
We know it's been quiescent for a while. It probably fed on a planetary size object about two years ago. We saw the X-rays come out of it. So we know it's an active black hole, but we've never been able to image it because there's so much dust until the Chandra X-ray telescope that we run right here at the Center for Astrophysic just imaged the shock waves and the jets, the blue areas, coming out of the center of our Milky Way galaxy out of the giant black hole that exists there. So we're just beginning to image and see what our black hole looks like and how active it is. And this is the first photograph of it right here. Now there's one other topic and one other item I want to talk to you about because I am getting more excited day by day. And that is Comet Ison. How many of you have heard of it? How many of you have not? Okay. Comet Ison was discovered back in September 2012 by two Russian amateur astronomers, Vitaly Nevsky and Artem Novichonik. It's a little 15-inch telescope. They were photographing the sky, and here is the comet right there. It was part of the Ison survey. Doesn't look like much, does it? It's way out beyond the orbit of Jupiter. But because it was bright enough to be imaged, they realized this thing could be big. This could be interesting. So we've been following it now from September to now. We know that comets form in the outer reaches of our solar system. They are made of dust and rock and gas and ice and sand. They're leftover materials. And as they move in towards the sun, they grow long tails as the sun shines on them and heats them up. And from our platform here on Earth, occasionally they can be spectacular. There they are, dirty snowballs passing by the earth, moving in towards the sun, heated up by the sun with huge, huge tails of gas and dust behind them. When one of these occurs, it is spectacular. There are friends of mine who will go all over this planet to chase a solar eclipse. I've seen one, it was pretty cool. I don't think I'll go chase another one, but I would go anywhere for a comet because they there's something mystical about them when they appear in the sky. You suddenly realize when the ancient world, when one of these things appeared in your sky one night, how frightening it could be. So we have great expectations for Ison. Now, we have belts of junk and debris around our solar system. We have the sun, we have the asteroid belt that's located between Mars and Jupiter, and then further out near Pluto, we have an area called the Kuiper Belt. And comets can originate from these areas. Just this week, from our asteroid belt, we got a picture of something that surprised us. Two little asteroids that are growing tails. They look like comets. They do have ice. They do have volatile materials on them. And this was the first time taken by Hubble. This is actually the same asteroid. Tails growing in different directions. They said it looked like a lawn sprinkler. But even the material in our asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter can turn into a comet-like object. Most of the comets that come from the Kuiper belt are called periodic comets. They come back. They come back in a short period of time. So we see them as old friends. We see them over and over and over again because their orbit really doesn't take them that far out of dodge. They just go into the asteroid belt, turn around, and come back around the sun. One of the most famous periodic comets is Halley. Halley comet Halley's comet returns to the Earth over and over and over again. It's a periodic. Each time it has a slightly different path. Each time it's either brighter or dimmer than before, but it comes back. It's an old friend we can count on. But if you go outside like Comet Ison, and this is one of the pictures taken of Comet Ison just the other day with a telescope, you can see it has jets coming out of it now. It's growing a long tail. 
These comets only come by once. They come from much farther in our solar system. They come from an area called the Oort cloud. If our entire solar system, including Pluto, was wrapped up into this little dot right here, the Oort cloud is like a bubble that surrounds us. These comets only come by once. We'll never see them in our lifetime again. One of the most famous of these was Hale-Bopp. As beautiful as Hale-Bopp was, it's not coming back. We will not see it. And it appears Ison is one of these comets, too. Already, they're comparing Ison to the possibility of it looking like the great comet of 1680 that was visible in the daytime, with a huge tail behind it. We don't know. You can't predict what a comet's going to do when it comes in, because there's so many variables, so many things that can go wrong. We thought Kohotek was going to be beautiful. How many people in this room saw Kohotek? Did you really? Gosh, <laughs> I was living in Santa Cruz with binoculars and telescopes. Days, 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 we never saw it. And the reason was it was covered with a dark carbon shell that never burned off. And because it didn't burn off, the volatiles didn't grow into a tail, into a coma, and we didn't see it. It looked big, but it was a big disappointment. So consequently, this is what can happen to comets sometimes. When they started comparing to the great comet of 1680, as some astronomers backed away and said, Ooh, wow, I don't really know about that. These are the photographs that have been recently taken of Ison, all the way back to October 5th, October 16th, November 2nd, November 10th, November 11th, and November 14th. It's growing in size. You can see it in the morning right now. And this is the most exciting picture of Comet Ison that I've seen so far. It was taken on November 17th from an amateur in Austria. He was using a small digital camera with a 50 millimeter lens. This is what's exciting about it. The length of that tail right now is an estimated 10 million miles long. It would comfortably fit just inside the bowl of the Big Dipper in size. When Comet Ison comes near the sun, it should grow to 100 million miles and be 10 times larger than that. So, we'll know on Thanksgiving Day. Comet Ison is moving in towards the sun. It's called a sun grazer because it's going to graze the sun. It's going to almost touch the atmosphere of the sun. It approaches within 750,000 miles of the surface of the sun. And when you come that close to the sun, many things can happen to you on its orbit as it moves in. On 2 o'clock Thanksgiving, we will find out whether or not Ison broke up into pieces whether Ison fell into the sun, or common Ison, like a giant roaster in outer space, survived its trip around the sun on Thanksgiving Day, and is going to appear in our sky. We're hoping it survives, but even if it breaks up into pieces, we've seen other comets that have broken into small pieces. This was Comet McNaught. I got a phone call when McNaught was in our sky a few years ago from South Africa one morning, and it was a gentleman who said, I'm seeing seven stripes in the sky. What is it? I thought, how would I know? I'm sitting here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I don't know what you're looking at in South Africa. It was the tail of this comet that had broken up into individual pieces, and each piece looked like a baby comet. This is the comet, if I could have a time machine and go back, I would love to see. Comet Chesso of 1744, it had between five and seven brilliant tails that spanned across the sky. This was a sun grazer that got too close to the sun, broke up into smaller pieces, and each piece became another individual comet. So, if you go out tomorrow morning, if it's clear, or the morning's up until the next week, Comet Ison is growing closer and closer to the sun. It's near the east at sunrise. Take binoculars and scan this area of the sky. You'll see the little planet Mercury near the horizon, and Mars will be above it. Look over underneath the bowl of the Big Dipper, and you'll see a second comet that's in the sky, Comet Lovejoy. We have maps over here for you to take home so you can see where to look for them. And this is why you need to be on our mailing list. 
if it does turn out to be our comet of the century or something that is quite spectacular, on Saturday, December 14th at 5 a.m., we will meet here, go up on the roof with giant binoculars, and we will see the comet and be able to view it from here in Cambridge. And yes, there will be hot cider and hot chocolate for all of you that join us. But what's important is you need to give us a call. I put this number here, but it's also printed on our information there. In case it rains, it snows, or we have to move the day, you will know by calling this number and there'll be a recorded message. So we're hoping you can join us. We're hoping this comet lives up to its reputation and that we are going to be able to see something amazing. Quickly, lastly, next month, please join us. As I've said before, we spared no expense, expense to bring this guy in. He has two new National Geographic books that have just come out. Alien Worlds and Space Encyclopedia. One is for kids, one is for an older audience. But what we'll find out is why these books were written, what we've discovered about alien worlds, what different forms of life could happen on some of these worlds when you take the Earth and just tweak it a little bit differently. It will be a fun evening, and again, as we did earlier, we'll be giving away a telescope to some lucky person that comes here and wins the drawing. So we're hoping you can join us in December for our last observatory night of 2013.